And I think you're talking about the limitations. We, we cannot defy the math. We cannot defy the statistics. Economics is like... It is what it is. You can't argue about it. It's just the math. Well, parts of it are. And, but I'm concerned about the arguable parts. The parts of how are we going to have distribute the wealth of this world in a more equitable and fair manner than has ever been done before, perhaps. I have the exact topic for that. And we... How about we do part on this and the other part on that? Okay, would you, would yeah. You, I'm, would that's, you, I, I actually have two specific topics that directly address that. And one of the reasons that I want to get this type of knowledge in people's heads is for them to realize that mathematically that can work. You can, you can have a society that's developed okay. around these things. By the, the, the ones that we can't move, we can if we can move stuff around and and ratchet levers. There are ways to ratchet levers and make things work the way you want them right. to. And you can, Obviously, the one percent has has used those levers to move things the way they wanted to, and they've been incredibly successful at doing that. When you look at the things that they say on on television about how economics works, like this trickle down effect, that's not mathematical. Like there's no there's no trickle down equation for how that works. It's pure bullshit. It, 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 that is not trickle down is not a not a theory. There's no it's it's like saying, you know, that if you do, a lot of them they say, well, if you do this, if you cut taxes, that that creates more jobs. Well, that's not true. Either. That's not. Each time we have done that, that is not shown right. to happen. Right. In fact, a lot of times the opposite. The, the evidence is otherwise. Yeah. But the people with uh, the ideology say, I don't really care about the evidence. My ideology is what's important, and I'm going to sell it no matter what the evidence is. And at that point in time, you've left economics entirely, really. Right. You're saying it's economics, but you're completely, you're completely like in a different world. And, and we're trapped in that a bit in the public sphere. You know, who, who is giving us our information? Who is coming? People who probably don't know anything about it. And the, the experts and so on are all kind of pushed aside as eggheads or liberals or whatever and we get a steady steady drive diet of drivel and falsehoods and lies and deceptions and we're looking for a way to to fight to fight that without getting bogged down in the details you know that my fear is to become bogged down in the details frustrates the goal i have to say you are inspiring me to change topic <laughs> Have you, have, are you familiar with Bertrand Russell? I love Bertrand. Are you familiar with uh, In Praise of Idleness? I've heard of it, but I, I can't okay. quote from it. Well, I, I want to read everyone. This is an interesting... He was a philosopher. Bertrand Russell, amazing, amazing thinker. The mathematician, wasn't he? He was a... Yeah, Bertrand Russell. Definitely so. Actually, maybe we will... Uh, Look up Bertrand Russell first. And I've lost since I got you. And I don't know if that's like what you were going to do or not, but like I, I kind of sympathize with like socialist viewpoints, and people are telling me all the time that like, well, socialism would never be able to work. Is that really true? Um, it does work. Well, hold on. There's. There's issues with what's the meaning of life? Of it. Can you stop? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No. There's issues of aspects. Of, I feel and, so and sorry another, for you. Well, there's there's also see. Remember, I told you as soon as I did the Fed talk that I I, I was expecting the Fed talk to be completely derailed within like 15 minutes. Or <laughs> like worms. if you do a Fed yeah. talk. But everyone was really receptive to like just at hearing least, the mechanical stuff and the history. It was good that we got the historical stuff in there too. So you can see that like I agree that there's I call shenanigans on the whole operation, <laughs> the way it's been run and the way that it was constructed, because obviously it was constructed with the one percent in mind. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. not, that's no that's not under dispute. It's they, they themselves <laughs> said it was constructed. They're very proud. <laughs> yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, very they didn't proud. know the internet was gonna happen. They didn't figure past the time they got away with it, they didn't figure anybody would remember it, you know, in years. Nobody reads history. <laughs> so, um, well, first, let me uh, get to Bert Bertrand Russell was actually a, uh, what is he? He is a, 
He's one of the founders of analytic philosophy. Uh, he led the British revolt against idealism. I am not actually familiar with that. He was a philosopher, logician, mathematician, historian, and social critic. And at times in his life, he considered himself a liberal, a socialist, and a pacifist. But he also admitted that he had never been any of those things in any profound sense. <laughs> so he's a, he's a unique mind, essentially. Like he, he has some things in common with those, with those things. And at the same time, he had his own opinions on those things and did not necessarily agree. And I think, I think at least all of us that are here, um, and probably anybody watching this video, has their own opinions that do not agree with any particular structural framework that anyone else has articulated. You don't yeah. agree with 100% of it. There's always a percentage that you really want to be slightly different. <coughs> and that's kind of part of what we're trying to figure out, how we can all coexist within that. Um, Finding the common ground. But, yeah. uh, but I heard this joke about that. And I just want to. Tell <laughs> Sorry, I'm just. This, this is this is so timely. Is that uh, this really heavy set guy in a buffet line? He had like two like two plates on each arm, and he's just loading them up. And the guys behind him going, "Man, you keep eating like that, you're not going to live very long." And he said, "You know what?" My dad lived to the age of 112, or my uh, my grandfather lived to the age of 112. So he didn't he didn't uh, he didn't get that old eating like that. He said, "You know how he did get that old?" I said, "Wow, minding your own damn business." <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of like a little bit of us not being quite as offended by stuff that's not really our business. Kind of. Stuff. I think that's I think it's a good just thing to teach it's like okay well you know you don't like that okay well don't do that yeah. you know let them go do that over there you, you don't, don't need like a... gay marriage don't yeah don't don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't get gay marriage don't don't like abortion no get abortion yeah and it's just a little bit more of like there's no one right way to live and we shouldn't try to pretend like there is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um, but this is a really good I'm glad we have such a small group that we can kind of go wildly off track and just be do whatever's interesting. But this is this is something he wrote, and this is directly pertaining because he knew about economics as well as philosophy. Um, and this is an interesting perspective. This was written in 1932. Take into account. It says, like most of my generation, I was brought up on the saying, "Satan finds some mischief for idle hands to do." Being a highly virtuous child, I believed all that I was told and acquired a conscience which kept me working hard down to the present moment. But although my conscience has controlled my actions, my opinions have undergone a revolution. I think that there is far too much work done in the world, that immense harm is caused by the belief that work is virtuous, and that what needs to be preached in modern industrial countries is quite different from what always has been preached. Everyone knows the story of the traveler in Naples who saw 12 beggars lying in, in the sun. It was before the days of Mussolini. <laughs> he, he likes to throw the little jabs in there. And offered a lira to the laziest of them. 11 of them jumped up to claim it, so he gave it to the 12th. This traveler was on the right line. <laughs> this traveler was, was on the right lines. But in countries which do not enjoy Mediterranean sunshine, idleness is more difficult, and a great public propaganda will be required to inaugurate it. I hope that, after reading the following pages, the leaders of the YMCA will start a campaign to induce good men to do nothing, good young men to do nothing. If so, I shall not have lived in vain. Before advancing my own argument for arguments for laziness, I must dispose of one which I cannot accept. Whenever a person who already has enough to live on proposes to engage in some everyday kind of job, such as school teaching or typing, he or she is told that such conduct takes the bread out of other people's mouths and is therefore wicked. If this argument were valid, it would only be necessary for us all to be idle in order that we should have our mouths full of bread. What people who say such things forget is that what a man earns he usually spends, and in spending he gives employment. As long as a man spends his income, he puts just as much bread into people's mouths in spending as he takes out of other people's mouths in earning. 
The real villain from this point of view is the man who saves. If he merely puts his savings in a stocking, like the proverbial French peasant, it is obvious that they do not give employment. If he invests his savings, the matter is less obvious, and different cases arise. One of the commonest things to do with savings is to lend them to some government. In view of the fact that the bulk of the public expenditure of most civilized governments consists in payment for past wars or preparation for future wars, the man who lends his money to a government is in the same position as the bad men in Shakespeare who hire murderers. The net result of the man's economic economical habits is to increase the armed, armed forces of the state to which he lends his savings. Obviously, it would be better if he spent the money, even if he spent it in drink or gambling. <laughs> but, I shall be told, the case is quite different when savings are invested in industrial enterprises. When such enterprises succeed and produce something useful, this may be conceded. In these days, however, no one will deny that most enterprises fail. That means that a large amount of human labor, which might have been devoted to producing something that could be enjoyed, was expended on producing machines which, when produced, lay idle and did no good to anyone. The man who invests his savings in a concern that goes bankrupt is therefore injuring others as well as himself. If he spent his money, say, in giving parties for his friends, they, we may hope, would get pleasure and so would all those upon whom he spent money, such as the butcher, the baker, and the bootlegger. <laughs> but, if he sp- <laughs> but if he spends it, let us say, upon laying down rails for surface cars, in some place where surface cars turn out not to be wanted, he has diverted a mass of labor into channels where it gives pleasure to no one. Nevertheless, when he becomes poor through the failure of his investment, he will be regarded as a victim of undeserved misfortune, whereas the gay spendthrift who spent his money philanthropically will be despised as a fool and a frivolous person. (laughs) All this is only preliminary. I want to say in all seriousness that a great deal of harm is being done in the modern world by belief in the virtuousness of work, and that the road to happiness and prosperity lies in an organized diminution of work. First of all, what is work? Work is of two kinds. First, altering the position of matter at or near the Earth's surface relatively to other such matter... Mm-hmm. Second, telling other people to do so. <laughs> the first kind is unpleasant and ill-paid. The second is pleasant and highly paid. The second kind is capable of indefinite extension. There are not only those who give orders, but those who give advice as to what orders should be given. <laughs> Usually two opposite kinds of advice are given simultaneously by two organized bodies of men. This is called politics. <laughs> the skill required for this kind of work is not knowledge of the subjects as to which advice is given, but knowledge of the art of persuasive speaking and writing. Mm. It asked of advertising. Mm. Throughout Europe, though not in America, there is a third class of men, more respected than either of the classes of workers. These are men who through ownership of land, are able to make others pay for the privilege of being allowed to exist and to work. (laughs) These landowners are idle, and I might therefore be expected to praise them. Unfortunately, their idleness is only only rendered possible by the industry of others. Indeed, their desire for comfortable idleness is historically the source of the whole gospel of work. The last thing they have ever wished is that others should follow their example. From the beginning of civilization until the Industrial Revolution, a man could, as a rule, produce by hard work little more than was required for the subsistence of himself and his family, although his wife worked at least as hard as he did, and his children added their labor as soon as they were old enough to do so. The small surplus above bare necessaries was not left to those who produced it, but was appropriated by warriors and priests. In times of famine, there was no surplus. The warriors and priests, however, still secured as much as at other times, with the result that many of the workers died of hunger. This system persisted in Russia until 1917, and he's got a footnote next to that, which I'll address at the end, and and still persists in the East. In England, in spite of the Industrial Revolution, it remained in full force throughout the Napoleonic Wars and until a hundred years ago, when the new class of manufacturers acquired power. In America, the system came to an end with the revolution, except in the South, where it persisted until the Civil War. A system which which lasted so long and ended so recently 
has naturally left a profound impress upon men's thoughts and opinions. Much that we take for granted about the desirability of work is derived from this system and, being pre-industrial, is not adapted to the modern world. Modern technique has made it possible for leisure, within limits, to be not the prerogative of small privileged classes, but a right evenly distributed among the community. The morality of work is the morality of slaves, and the, mor and the modern world has no need of slavery. It is obvious that, in primitive communities, peasants left to themselves would not have parted with the slender surplus upon which warriors and priests subsisted, but would have either produced less or consumed more. At first, sheer force compelled them to, to produce in part with the surplus. Gradually, however, it was found possible to induce many of them to accept an ethic according to which it was their duty to work hard, although part of their work went to support others in idleness. By this means, the amount of compulsion required was lessened, and the expenses of government were diminished. To this day, 99% of British wage earners would be genuinely shocked if it were proposed that the king should not have a larger income than a working man. The conception of duty, speaking historically, has been a means used by the holders of power to induce others to live for the interests of their masters rather than for their own. Of course, the holders of power conceal this fact from themselves by managing to believe that their interests are identical with the larger interests of humanity. Sometimes this is true. Athenian slave owners, for instance, employed part of their leisure in making a permanent contribution to, the civil, to civilization, which would have been impossible under a just economic system. Leisure is essential to civilization, and in former times, leisure for the few was only rendered possible by the labors of the many. But their labors were valuable, not because work is good, but because leisure is good. And with modern technique, it would be possible to distribute leisure justly without injury to civilization. Modern technique has made it possible to diminish enormously the amount of labor required to secure the necessaries of life for everyone. I keep wanting to say necessities, but he says necessaries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm like, want to say it. This was made obvious during the war. At that time, all the men in the armed forces and all the men and women engaged in the production of munitions. All the men and women engaged in spying, war propaganda, or government offices connected with the war were withdrawn from productive occupations. In spite of this, the general level of well-being among unskilled wage earners on the side of the Allies was higher than before or since. Hmm. The significance of this fact was concealed by finance. Borrowing made it appear as if the future was nourishing the present. But that, of course, would have been impossible. A man cannot eat a loaf of bread that does not yet exist. The war showed conclusively that, by the scientific organization of production, it is possible to keep modern populations in fair comfort on a small part of the working capacity of the modern world. If, at the end of the war, the scientific organization, which had been created in order to liberate men for fighting and munition work, had been preserved, and the hours of the week had been cut down to four, all would have been well. Instead of that, the old chaos was restored. Those whose work was demanded were made to work long hours, and the rest were left to starve as unemployed. Why? Because work is a duty, and a man should not receive wages in proportion to what he has produced, but in proportion to his virtue as exemplified by his industry. Hmm. This is the morality of the slave state, applied in circumstances totally unlike those in which it arose. No wonder the result has been disastrous. Let us take an illustration. Suppose that, at a given moment, a certain number of people are engaged in the manufacture of pins. They make as many pens as the world needs, working, say, eight hours a day. Someone makes an invention by which the same number of men can make twice as many pens. Pens are already so cheap that hardly any more will be bought at a lower price. In a sensible world, everybody concerned in the pen manufacturing of pens would take to working four hours instead of eight, and everything else would go on as before. But in the actual world, this would be thought demoralizing. The men still work eight hours, there are too many pens, some employers go bankrupt, half the men previously concerned in making pens are thrown out of work. There is, in the end, just as much leisure as the other plan, 
but half the men are totally idle, while half are still overworked. In this way, it is ensured that the unavoidable leisure shall cause misery. Wow. <laughs> All round, instead of being a universal source of happiness, can anything more insane be imagined? That's awesome. The idea that the poor should have leisure has always been shocking to the rich. In England, in, in the early 19th century, 15 hours was the ordinary day's work for a man. Children wow. sometimes did as much and very commonly did 12 hours a day. When meddlesome busybodies suggested that perhaps these hours were rather long, they were told that work kept adults from drink and children from mischief. <laughs> when I was a child, shortly after urban working men had acquired the vote, certain public holidays were established by law to the great indignation of the upper classes. I remember hearing an old duchess say, what do the poor want with holidays? They ought to work. People nowadays are less frank, but the sentiment persists and is the source of much of our economic confusion. Let us for a moment consider the ethics of work frankly, without superstition. Every human being of necessity consumes, in the course of his life, a certain amount of the produce of human labor. Assuming, as we may, that labor is on the whole disagreeable, it is unjust that a man should consume more than he produces. Of course, he may provide services rather than commodities, like a medical man, for example. But he should provide something in return for his board and lodging. To this extent, the duty of work must be admitted, but to this extent only. I shall not dwell upon the fact that, in all modern societies outside the USSR, many people escape even this minimum amount of work, namely all those who inherit money and all those who marry money. I do not think the fact that these people are allowed to be idle is nearly so harmful as the fact that wage earners are expected to overwork or starve. If the ordinary wage earner worked four hours a day, there would be enough for everybody and no unemployment, assuming a certain very moderate amount of sensible organization. This idea shocks the well-to-do because they are convinced that the poor would not know how to use so much leisure. In America, Men often work long hours even when they are well off. Such men naturally are indignant at the idea of leisure for wage earners, except as the grim punishment of unemployment. In fact, they dislike leisure even for their sons. Oddly enough, while they wish their sons to work so hard as to have no time to be civilized, they do not mind their wives and daughters having no work at all. The snobbish admiration of uselessness, which in an aristocratic society extends to both sexes, is under a plutocracy confined to women. This, however, does not make it any more in agreement with common sense. The wise use of leisure, it must be conceded, is a product of civilization and education. A man who has worked long hours all his life will become bored if he becomes suddenly idle. But without a considerable amount of leisure, a man is cut off from many of the best things. There is no longer any reason why the bulk of the population should suffer this deprivation only a foolish asceticism, usually vicarious, makes us continue to insist on work in excessive quantities now that the need no longer exists. I will make another reminder. This is 1932 when this was written. That's right as, as the Depression was ending, right? Yeah, it was just pre-World War World War II, yeah. It was just when that was getting... I no, I don't think it was ending. I have a somewhat no, short I was just getting started. Book in fact. 29 is when it started. 20 is in the dirty 30s. Right? 29 is when the jump crash in real quick. Yeah. Okay, she wanted to jump in real quick with the, the thing. We're kind of in. Uh, it's, it's from this book called Perfectly Legal by David K. Johnson about uh, like the uh, legal loophole, the tax corruption that goes on. And um, it says, uh, Government set tax rates are making decisions about who will profit or buy how much. A government that takes 90 cents out of each dollar above a threshold, as the U.S. did in the Eisenhower years, is deciding to limit the wealth that people can accumulate from their earnings. Likewise, a government that taxes the poor on their first dollar of wages, as the U.S. does with the Social Security, and Medicare taxes is deciding to limit or eliminate the ability of those at the bottom of the income ladder to save money and, 
and improve their lot in life. First, I would make the commentary that it's for the social good that you limit the amount of wealth, wealth somebody can accumulate. I don't see any moral right to having unlimited wealth. Unlimited amounts of resources, if you're saying that, then you're saying that one person can own 99% of the resources and leave the rest of us to starve. Yeah. Because, and, and if you don't, if you're not saying that, then we're just arguing a matter of degree at that point, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Would you like to try and, and synthesize what you were trying to say through the, the Bertrand Russian quote? What's that? Well, essentially... Kind of summarize it. Uh, or answer the question, what's the and point? Still, <laughs> well, fair enough. well, basically, even in 1932, it was scientifically evident that we did not have to have everyone working in order for us to live very comfortably. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the difference in productive capacity, Way more than and, and one of my areas of particular interest is technological advance and like patterns in technological advance and our automotive capabilities are so high I wrote a paper on this I probably don't even have on this laptop but I wrote a big research paper on this recently which is essentially that we don't even need humans to work at fast food restaurants right now they're automatable they're already doing it in Japan most things you can buy in a store they have in kiosks they have live lobster you can buy out of vending machines in Japan. <laughs> oh I mean, I know that's a little ridiculous. <laughs> no, 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 this is the point. That automation, when you put it out 50 years, 100 years... No, 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 not even that. 10 years. Max. We won't need any human number. labor in 10 pick years, max. Number. The point being that automation is going to make work less and less necessary. That And the yes. more people and less work means what? means we need to restructure our system of government and Absolutely. restructure the entire Thinking. assumptions that go into the economic process as it's been going on for the past couple of hundred years. It needs a rethinking process, well, and that's where we should be. The, the monetary economy depends upon constant consumption, and people can no longer consume when they're no longer employed. And because of, I mean, even in the 1930s he's talking about it, to a much larger degree today, there's certainly this thing called technological unemployment. Yes. So, as a human race, we're competing for a smaller and smaller and smaller of batch paper. of jobs. So, Absolutely. as people become unemployed, they can no longer consume. And if they can no longer consume, the entire monetary economy shuts down. Well, we were dealing with this back in the, in the 60s, talking about materialism, consumerism, the ugly destruction of the entire planet by people, what? Put, uh, pave paradise and put up a parking lot. That was our theme song because it seemed to us that the world was getting uglier and more commercial and more materialistic and farther and farther away from roots. We were going out saying, you know, we got to, we're going to go out and live on a farm. We're going to put it all away. We're going to forget electricity. Forget, we'll do it all ourselves. We'll live out in the wilderness and, and live real lives. And that was the greatest threat, I think, that the hippies and the counterculture offered. They're saying, we don't want your materialism. We don't want, we'd rather live in a cabin somewhere with a bunch of friends playing music and sitting around and screw your system. And they said, you cannot say that. <laughs> you are criminals. You're breaking down our very system. You're telling us that everything we're doing is wrong. And you're saying, and we said, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And they said, you must die. <laughs> and it happened. We were ridiculed. We were disenfranchised. We were marginalized. We were turned into a joke. And it's happening all over again. Yeah. But the same spirit of dematerializing, that this is an ugly, we've created an ugly materialistic world, the values are all turned upside down, we're not living for anything that means anything anymore, and everybody's saying, 
not how did we get there, but how do we get out of here? Well, we're, Where's we're, the door? We're, we're dealing with, with a lot of symptoms that result from the monetary economy. The monetary economy depends upon cyclical consumption. Cyclical consumption is at odds with efficiency. You think about designing a product and building a product. You can't design a product to last. You can't design a product from the best best materials known to, to man because it wouldn't be cost competitive. You wouldn't be able to sell it. And if it lasts forever, no one would ever consume another one. See, now, the, now the trick with that is that you have to tug those. You have to tug those economic levers to to. Slip. You know what result you want. You want extremely durable goods. So how do we get to where we're incentivized to make extremely durable goods and penalized for making non-durable goods? One one way is product take. One way no. One way is like product take back, where you say that you have to pay for the for the in disposal of everything mm -hmm. you produce. Right, mm -hmm. waste. And, and what that does is it encourages extremely modular design, it encourages reuse of materials. What's that phrase again? I've heard that before, but it's been a long time. It's, it's, What's it, it's called, take back? it's called product take back. Product it's where, that, it's where you're I've responsible for all the waste produced right, by right. your, that, they do that and, I, and I agree now. that that consumption in and of itself as being like a measure of GDP saying that we are more successful because there's more consumption. At one point in time that was true, but now we have a situation where our economies are have overwhelmed our our global ecology. Right. And now we need to develop a new integrated system between that. Well, and that's where you get into that resource-based resource-based economy is a good example of trying to mesh some ecological Economical. Uh, yeah, it's important. I sciences. think that, that products are designed and developed and produced in the most resource-efficient way, rather than the most cost-efficient way. Because when cost efficiency is a measure of your success of your product, then you're rewarded by cutting corners and using mm -hmm. crappy products. And so and it's you come out, you come planned obsolescence. You come out with a product that that's a piece of crap right off the shelf. <laughs> Right? Because that, okay. that's the only way that whatever company is producing that product can continue to sell more and more and more and upgrade it. And by the way, they all wear out and they all need to be serviced. That generates income for another sector of the entire society yes. in a monetary economy. The service sector. People need to repair and service products. If that, if products were designed in an efficient way that were durable and didn't break down, didn't wear out, didn't become obsolete, that part of the monetary economy would shut down. Cyclical consumption would shut down. Our monetary economy as a whole would collapse. And I, and I have to bring up what we did in the 60s, and they said, nuclear power is an answer. Well, not if you consider the waste. Not if you can't put into the accounting, get on the books. What are you going to do with this stuff? Just add the numbers, you know, well, leave, leave the no. health out of it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go take a slightly contrary position on that, is sure. that... What? Coal puts out more radioactive material than nuclear power does per kilowatt hour. Really? Well, radioactive? Be yes, because they all that, that. They're, they're not, it's not like they're getting pure crap in there. I mean, there's all kinds of Ooh. stuff in coal veins. Mm. That's where it's the, that's where all the mercury in the fish comes from. That's where all the cadmium poison in the rivers comes from. And it's, that's all from they only, the EPA only just started regulating mercury emissions of coal plants mm. like a year or two ago, something like that. Yikes. It's crazy. Like, if you think about it, mercury, there is no known safe level of mercury in your system or lead or cadmium. Those are all like, even Toxics. the tiniest bit is bad. Mm -hmm. you where do, do they not come want from? Even, mercury emission of where? From coal-fired power, coal fire power plants. Coal fire. Energy, energy on this planet is nothing but abundant. They, they talk about geothermal being able to produce 4,000 years of electricity for this planet. They talk about being able to harness just one ten-thousandth part of the solar energy hitting this planet would be enough to meet all of our energy needs. I think it's four ten thousandths. Uh, Sorry, crap. one of my no. like, weird... I know, it's, it, it, no, anyway, actually, it energy, energy is nothing but abundant on this planet. But we're led to believe by the energy industry, which is the largest industry on the planet, mm -hmm. we're led to believe that energy is scarce. Why? Because in a monetary 
economy, scarcity means value. The more you can right. convince the public that something is scarce, there's not a lot of it to go around, the more you can hike up the price. Supply and demand. And so, yeah, and, and, and part of the problem with that is you have you know, transparent. One thing that allows that to occur is lack of transparency. We're really not aware of how much of everything there is. No one's accountable for that. They can say that that's, that's how we get, when I was referring to the supply shock, for example, an oil supply shock has a very specific, like measurable effect on yeah. on things, the way that that works. Like it, it really, and, and the people who control the strings, I mean, they have the ability to put us through a supply shock in that. Very, right. Very oh, yeah. They do regularly, so, right? So those industries can, can uh, deliberately withhold production to make their, their products more scarce, or they can be dishonest about the availability of their resources to make their products seem more scarce. Both of those behaviors are rewarded in a monetary economy. Both of those are rewarded because more profits. Yeah. More scarcity equals more profits. Isn't one of the issues the difference between the free market economy and all the free market uh, theories and social engineering, this, the thought that we could actually engineer systems that work better, that are more humane, <coughs> that, that are more e equal, that um, spread the wealth amongst people more equality, equitably. Humanity. Like no matter shareable. how, what their actual contribution is, that there should be no beggars, there should be no homeless, there should be no starving, no matter what they have to offer to the society, because that's a humane society rather than an economically uh, sane society. That we have to change the paradigms of free market economy right, right. and move towards what the curse of social engineering, which means getting together and say, how can we make this thing work for everybody? Right. So all of us sitting around this table recognize that uh, there are starving people in this in this world, right? And I think all of us around this table believe that that shouldn't be. None of us wants people to starve. None of us wants people to starve or or, or, or die because they don't have enough money to afford food right. or, or, or health care. Um, but. but it's hard to convince, especially Americans, who are doing pretty well financially. The monetary system is working pretty well for most Americans, especially relative to people in, I don't know, Africa. Um, but I recently thought of something that, that I think will be helpful in talking to the average Joe American, and that is, why should I care? Why should I? I'm doing fine. Why do I care about 35,000 people dying every day of starvation and preventable disease? It doesn't affect me. I'm okay. But the problem that, that results from a system of depravity when you have a huge population of the planet that's more and more depraved, dying, starving, they get pissed off. Then comes terrorism. I mean, you think about terrorism, our, the United States global corporatization of the planet creates terrorists in that we set up systems in other countries that deprive people. We make these huge loans to these countries the money of which goes all to our own corporations to build infrastructure and crap that they don't need. And then these countries are left with this huge debt that they can't pay off. And that country, the po population of those countries start to starve. That creates a negative feeling towards Americans and the U.S. So if, people, if we don't take care of everyone on this planet, we create terrorists. We create a, a, a situation for us that's not safe. I mean, think about living in Sacramento. If the shit hits the fan, people are gonna be out on the streets with guns. And I have a good amount of money, and I've got food in my fridge, but I can't stop someone who's putting a gun to my head and saying, give me all the food in your fridge. So it, it's about safety. Well, you're saying it's a matter, a question of self-interest, and mm -hmm. the system of competition for, for scarce resources, some get it, some don't, winners versus losers, you right. can't pick winners, you can't pick losers. This is the old free market system 
which I think is coming into question now across this whole planet. Everybody's looking at it and saying, this works very well for some people, but not at all well right. for most people. Right. Right. And the people selling it to us are the ones who are profiting from it, and we're just not buying it anymore. Right. We're not exactly sure what went wrong or how we got here, but we know this is not right. And, and, so to and because, because we believe in a community of human beings that are not in competition with each other to see who can get the most resources and devil take the hindmost, what makes us humans is community, that we take care of each other right. kind of like right. a big human family. Right. Right. And we don't cast people aside because they don't have the skills that we have. We don't say, well, that's right. my sister, but she's kind of a little disabled and, you know, we really <laughs> don't need her. So if she's picking through the, the garbage for cat food, well, you know, that's just uh, the way the system works. And we're saying, no, this cannot stand. Yeah, exactly. And we're not exactly how sure how we're going to get there, but we're going to have a community again. Right, and if I could propose a clarification to what you just said, which I totally agree with, the system that is under question, the system that people are revolting against, the, pe the system that leaves haves and the haves nots that leave so many people out of the equation that causes creates so many losers in the world that system is i believe the monetary economy it's a system of money money is the problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if i can just yeah um i want to touch on both things um uh you were talking about you know well how can we get the average joe to care about you know beyond what they're going through. And you know what, to be realistic, if we're going on like, you know, whether it's affecting you as a person or not, then I would be here. Because right now it's not affecting me at all. Me My mom's an attorney, I'm, I'm fine. Right. You know, but the, the fact is, my mom wasn't always well off. You know, she was one of five very poor kid, and she worked her butt off to put herself through school. She's, you know, Hispanic, so she picked tomatoes, she cleaned houses, she walked the dogs, so, you know, she she worked her butt off to get where she is. And so, even lots of us, or upper middle class, mm -hmm. were only that On way because side. somebody along the lines in our family worked their butt off. And we owe it to, um, to contribute to the system that allowed us to get to where we are. And in terms of terrorism, you know, we say, oh, you know, we, we're fighting this war on terror. And like you said, we contributed we to this it. very system that, to very this very thing that we're fighting against, and we continue. To contribute it by bombing these people and creating hate because they see their loved ones die around them we're only making it worse you know so that's just my yeah. two cents yeah Good no two I, cents. I agree and so you're saying that you're not you're maybe more on the winning side of the equation than the losing side of the equation in terms of money and your personal well-being in this system and yet <coughs> despite that you still join the movement you're still so I, yeah. I, I, I think what you're saying is I that haven't even qualified for financial aid until this right. past November right. because I just turned 24 so my mom makes too much money so I and think I'm there fine are, with that so I think there there may be a vast majority of people even in the United States even that, that they're on the winning side of the equation slightly or greatly that will still feel compelled to join the movement, yeah. still feel compelled to um, do something about this system. And, and, and I agree and, I, and I'm hopeful that that's the case. I'm just saying that there is also a subset of the population, especially in the United States, that will have that reaction to the things that we talk about. Get out of my face, I don't really care, I'm doing fine, check it out, you know, <laughs> yeah. Mercedes, whatever. See ya, I gotta get back to work, or I, I gotta go, you know, on my vacation. So we have to start talking about human values as being important. 
that people right, to look people at homelessness and look at hunger and say, eh, it's not really my problem. That is corrupt. That is inhumane. That is defying the value structure that we've been trying to build up over thousands of years. That we're in this together, that we care about each other, that, that no one is, should be left behind, that we don't put children out on out ice flows just because they're inconvenient, because all people are valuable and all people are equally right. valuable and, and, and all people that, deserve... I'm worried that a lot of people won't be on board with that line of thinking. While I'm totally on board with that, well, I they're going that to have to get on care. board. We so, have to be shocked at homelessness. We have to be disgusted by children in hu Hungary. We have to share that with the world. We have to say, this cannot stand. We can't. It reflects upon us as a people. Right. It reflects Once upon America. Gone. People look and see our homeless, and they think, this is America, the world, the richest country in the world. You're kidding me. How right. did this happen? How so, can you? call yourself a Christian nation right. and then ignore the poor and ignore the hungry. So what I'm Our saying country is, is asleep and needs to be woken up and this movement is part of the effort to wake them up. Right, right. So, so what I'm saying is another tool that we might have at our disposal with which to wake people up. Beyond all the things that you just mentioned, which I think are very valuable, and I use those those kinds of tools in my own toolbox as I'm an activist for the Zeitgeist Movement or an activist for Occupy, or I'm out there doing the work and talking to people. That's a tool. I think another effective tool that we can have in our toolbox is <laughs> scaring the shit out of people, right? Because, I mean, you're going to have people that say, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care, starving people, I don't care. You know, poor people, I don't care, I'm doing fine. They're going to reject every tool that you have, everything that you talk to them about. And then you can say, well, wait a second, you know what? If we don't do something about this, guess what? There's going to be riots in the streets. There are going to be people at your door of your nice mansion in Fair, Fair Oaks with, you know, shotguns. <laughs> That's exactly what religion and, and the government accomplished. They used fear. They used the what? The government... Oh, and their war against terrorism, that's what they're using here. Right. And it is very effective, as, as we can all see. And the same thing with, you know, religion to control the masses. No offense to any religion here. But a large a large part of their, you know, message uses fear, you know, to control people. So I think fear is a very effective Organized religion has definitely been a tool for one percent for oh yeah. virtually all of history. It's not like, you know, you look at the Vatican, it's not like they earned that money. As more they, and they more either... information becomes available and easily accessed, <laughs> that yeah. won't stand. It's only a matter of time before. Well the thing it, it, it's really hard to make the argument that you're that you're for the poor when you live in a palace. It's yeah. a, it's a, it's logically there is a disconnect there. And the only, I mean, you just have to just try to ignore that when, you know, when, when the Pope has a hat that's like valued at like $16 million or whatever his hat's valued at, why you wouldn't just eBay that and feed a bunch of poor people if you're really, I mean, like it's just a hat, man, he should make a bunch of them because I guarantee you a personally signed Pope hat would generate a lot of income for the poor. I'm, That's a very hey, good well, idea. You know, or you whatever. Just think of see, I mean, no, but see, it all goes into these big vaults of treasures and stuff like that, and those really should be. I mean, I mean, cultural treasures should be available for everyone, and they should not be. You know, at some point in time, we have to decide as a people that we need to preserve those things. He's saving. I just want wanted I'm sure, to say. I'm sure wait, that oh. um, that. Uh, there's a reason why, you know, um, Jesus' supposed, you know, actual message is ignored by most of these, you know, um, conservative, right wing um, religious people. You know, I see some kind of disconnect where they're like, oh, you know, these people are being lazy. But you, you dissect what... Jesus actually do, did. He threw the money lenders out. You know, he preached. He preached. You know, let's feed the poor. But you know, do you see these people even paying attention to that fact? No. 
You know, they're at odds with their own religion. I just just wanted to say that what changed the civil rights situation was we didn't beat it out of them, we shamed them. The whole country was ashamed by the bombings, by the hoses and the dogs and that's thrown in their face. The, the, the country that didn't realize that was going on said, what? This can't be done in my name. I don't approve of this. I'm shocked. I'm incensed. I don't want to be. This is not America. And we started a civil rights struggle that involved more and more people mm -hmm. so that we could win the civil rights struggle. But it was shame that did it. Martin Luther King <coughs> shamed us into facing what we were doing. And I think that's something that we're going to do here, too. The shame the people like about hunger and homelessness Bye. and poverty, like saying a... you should be ashamed of yourself as a country to allow this to happen and to dismiss it and say, well, that's just the way things have to be. I'm uncomfortable, of course, with the shooting, but I, <laughs> I would like to invite people to get in touch with their, with, I believe, what is every human's deepest need to have em empathy and compassion. Um, but it's the same outcome, you know, except that I, yeah, I have less concerns about side effects along the way. But uh, I, yeah, what I, what I liked about MLK's, you know, approach was, yeah, definitely inviting us all, not I didn't hear so much judgment, or at least that's not how I took it, to the extent I heard speeches later, but just an invitation for us to get in touch with our desire to have community with all and compassion and want, you know, children to be able to play with one another regardless of their background and, you know, um, so I mean, I understand what Brandon was saying and I think that is, I think his point is... I understand what you're saying too. My preference is to appeal to people based on kind of what you're getting at under there. And I understand that that's it is it, it I've been torn myself to thinking about how to how to frame things um, in a way that's compelling to the one percent, so to speak. Because it's not so hard. I mean, it, it is actually a hard job to 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 wake up the ninety nine percent and to get that actually is a big job too, but. I, I also would like to take on the extra other challenge, which is it's a different set of arguments and approaches, and it's, it takes a lot of thought to think yeah. about how to appeal. Do we? We don't necessarily need to. If 99% of the people stand up and say no, go, not doing this anymore, no, that may be sufficient. Yeah. Actually, stand up. Yes. What? About 10% of the people standing up will do it. Well, 10 percent so. standing up, and maybe another like 30, 40 percent. Passively, passively saying support something yeah. like, like on like Facebook you. pages. Yep. Exactly. Oh, no, that, well, that would definitely... Think about it. Yeah. Like, well, Jewish like, people are less than 10% 10, 10 of the population. And look at the huge amount of sway well, they have on our foreign policy absolutely. and other things. It's because they're very organized. They're very vocal. They know how to wrench those levers. And so a small group of 10% who are very, very dedicated can definitely wrench those clear levers. Clear messages, clear intent. Yes. Translatable understandable well and just having your own people in the positions to make those decisions that yeah. too. I mean, or, or being buddies with the people who, who are or maybe even make it just be us that would be better well, like, <laughs> can I leave this here I gotta go get the, my uh, oh the sign stuff sure. yeah it's 235 till you soak up some yeah. knowledge here like, uh, we, we, we did, did. So, so, just download I think we're going to want to do yeah, it in front of it. City so, Hall, um, not here. Like, okay. We have troubles with that. We didn't get very table. far with okay. my you can do semi next week. plan sure. bus. Oh, yeah. so, um, I don't know what we want to do yeah, next yeah. week. Okay. Okay. So I'll meet you over there. Um, I think we should uh, kind of discuss whether we want this okay. to be, because this, yes. this turned into a general you discussion that went incredibly far afield from economics. Well, not even just that, but like we went way out of the I really want to learn the economics. See, I would like to do that too, but we need to decide what you know how much time we're going to spend on that versus discussion. I like the discussion. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Maybe next week. Although, we'll although I think we might want to do a we might want to do a style of like I don't know Oops, sorry. time sorry. discussion. I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know. Sure, Just so we sure. can bounce back, so we sure. give give a person yeah. a certain amount of time, and then like whoever wants to comment on that person's particular thing that they say. Like my thing I was reading was rather long, and I wasn't even done. I was about two thirds done. But it gets no, it gets even. He makes a very strong argument in the 30s for, like, 
we don't even need to be we don't need to all be working at all so and if you look at the change in productive capacity between then and now and the projected change in production which is one of the things i was getting ready to look up here um some of my research from my paper i can i can go and look at my research sources and then tease that information back out without actually looking Sean, at my she paper she has to go so maybe we should make a decision before she goes about what we're going to do so she can come back next well, week well i'm down with whatever people want to do next time should we I'm, go around and say what we all well want? i'm i guess i'm thinking just chiming in that we might want to see depending on who's there yeah. unless we need to make the decision ahead of time well i'd rather advertise it ahead of time and okay. just say okay this is what we're going to do here right and then yeah. like and it's fine if i mean since we have until four i'm not opposed to uh I'm not opposed to doing Both. like an hour and then an hour of free for all, yeah, whatever yeah. we want, whatever. That was kind of what I was trying to stimulate discussion with that paper because he said I mean, it, it was clear to him from a logical standpoint. Hmm. And that's where and see that he leads it. He leads into that resource based economy right. kind I, of. I'm amazed. If, I, do you see I, how I his, Russell, what, do you see how his going. argument totally. is leading to that? Yeah. Where he's just saying, no, yeah. what we need to value as an... Basically, what he gets down to essentially is what you want to value as an economic unit is human comfort and happiness. Mm -hmm. Is that that is the basic economic unit. You want to use that as your money, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, he doesn't come and say that, but that's kind of what I get out of it is that mm -hmm. economics should not be based on the presumption of scarcity in the way that we do it now, but maybe like, you know, human... If, if you're increasing human happiness, that has economic value. Right. If you're not... That should not be assigned economic value. Right. I have a right. proposal. We're decreasing human uh, Because I know she, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Celia. Celia, I'm Ann. Because I, I want us to have a way to get together in a comb. So I propose, and I did this just figured out, uh, not attached, that we do an hour of teaching and an hour of conversation starting at 2 next Saturday and ending at 4 before the... Uh, GA. I saw hands everywhere except with you. Oh, I was waving at some other people. I'm sorry. This sounds great to me. Okay. So, <laughs> are we in all agreement? Yeah. I would, I would say, and, and you could put that and, and announce it at the beginning that that's your request of everyone. And if that still doesn't quite, you know, there may be some, well, some room I can for do flexibility, is in other I can words. Put up like, two, in other words. I could put up two separate things. I think it. Two oh. and a thing at uh, three. Oh, I like economics that. Economics teach in on this topic. I like that. And at three economics is economics, economics discussion. discussion. <laughs> economics discussion working group. How about that? Yeah, we'll call it economics I like discussion that. Group or economics working group discussion group. Okay. I don't know. I'll figure out something that sounds <laughs> coherent. Three o'clock. And we'll see how that goes. I mean, we can always change it if it doesn't work. Because the only concern I have, but it may be moot, is... Sometimes, like, like you might bring something up and say, oh, my God, and they want to do some discussion right then for 15 minutes. You know, so, but let's just... Let's I'm not entirely opposed to that. Let's just but, try uh, what but you're I, saying. But at the same first. time, I also recognize it's very easy for the entire thing to derail into totally. free-for-all discussion and then just, like, and I there might be a couple people who learn really... I want to learn that I can take well, away. I want to know how to dig a ditch right. when I leave. Because we're, because we're dealing <laughs> with... kind of economics you want. Most people, and, and the, the, the problem... The problem I have when I try to explain economics and then people want to get into, like, I don't want to talk about in the box type of stuff, is that you got to learn the behavioral aspects because it's like thermodynamics. I don't know what one air molecule is going to do, but I know how large numbers of them are going to behave under certain conditions. And that is how sociology works. That's how economics works. It's if you shuffle enough people into a pile... Things will shake out a certain way, and it's just the way people are. Yeah. And that's why they have. Um, let me give you a couple of like key words. These are really important words in economics. This is very important. Okay. See you next week. <laughs> See you. Um, <laughs> economics is the study of how people allocate their limited resources uh, no, in an attempt to satisfy their unlimited wants. As such, economics is the study of how people make choices. Humans are overindulgers. We want everything. I don't agree with the unlimited wants. People have um, un people have essentially is that unlimited the, the big numbers. Essentially, it's not like you can always have another bag of Doritos, exactly. But there's always something else that would be nice to have. 
So maybe that if it like if they're even a theoretical thing. Yeah, yeah. Let's say like uh, a spinal repair machine. Even if you aren't using it yourself, like I want that. I want I want some sort of technology to repair the spines of people with spinal injuries. Absolutely, and I think we okay. need to have. That. Okay, gotcha. That okay. is a want. Okay. I want. I want all the children to be fed. My hair to grow back. <laughs> Quite frankly, and I would like the technology for that as well. And you know, I want I want the widespread uh, adoption of the tough choices when they have limited resources. Essentially, yes, exactly. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So okay. now, good point. Yeah. Resources and wants. These are the two keywords. Resources are things that have value, and more specifically, are used to produce things that satisfy people's wants. So resources are things that are used to to give people what they want, resources. Wants are all the things that people would purchase if they had unlimited income, essentially. It's everything that you, like if there's something you can get, if I could have a checking account large enough to, to write a check to buy everybody a lunch today in the whole world. I want that too. I, I would want to. <laughs> so, a big, nice, full sign. belly for everyone. So how about that? Cool. Now, Essentially, whenever an individual business or nation faces alternatives, the cho- when there's a choice that must be made, economics is the study of how those choices are made by people. So, um, and that's where we get into some very essentially human things, because humans are, we're, we're remarkably predictable. We have really not gotten too far away from our monkey. Uh, as I say, as my, my therapist friend says, he's like, we're, we're very much monkeys. We still very much value monkey things. And we don't like to talk about that or acknowledge that. But we're very... I mean, Sorry. Sorry. You know, no, just getting outraged. I was speaking like, sir. You brought that on. Yummy, yummy food, for example, is, is good. Yummy, yummy food. Yummy, yeah. yummy food, good. Pleasurable feelings of any kind, whether that's sex or, or euphoric drugs or whatever. Or, or, or just real, or, or really getting an exercise high or any of those things. Euphoric nice feelings. We, we want a oh, nice warm bed. We go after those things. I mean, we are not at all objective about that. Like, we're just drawn to that. Um, you know, we can be operantly conditioned just like, just like other animals. Oh, no, really. I mean, World of Warcraft is like this amazing Skinner box of operant conditioning if you study it. They have behavioral sciences. Scientists work on that game. It's to induce certain behavior, and that behavior is to keep playing, even if you don't enjoy it. You're not wow. always going to enjoy it. Even if you yeah. hate it, actually. Yes. Oh, no, I know people who, di- who dislike it and still play. I can't stand it. Maybe. Hours. Yes. 17 hours in one day so oh. that they can get enough of something to get this one little thing that they wanted. And then they're like, yay. But then it's like right back to it. Oh, wow. the high does not the last. Next thing tomorrow. Oh, no, it's horrible. And what they do You're is they give me insight into my children playing <laughs> certain Be careful. <laughs> M- MMORPGs are very dangerous. They can... M- they can what? What? Massive multiplayer online role okay, playing. He's not, games. They're actually not playing those yet. <laughs> um, a Highly good, addictive. A good article is called. Uh, it, it's from Cracked Magazine, believe it or not. They have a lot of actually very good <laughs> articles there, and it's uh, I think it's like five creepy things video games are doing to control your mind. And I mean, they, they break down like the specific behavioral can you mechanisms. Send that to me? Sure. Five creepy things. That's what really what it's called. I think it's called Five Creepy Things. It might be Six Creepy Things, but oh no! It, and and there and it's creepy. If you read it, it will it will freak you out. I want to read that. I, do have my I mean, it, it even has a quote from a Microsoft game designer talking about how you use certain mechanisms to get the to promote the uh, the uh, desired behavior in the customer. Like I mean, like how you get them to do certain things, not in the game world, in the real world. How you get them to do things in the real world by Changing oh, really? parameters. Okay. Oh yeah. So because it's online too, they can monitor that the game is going on. Actually oh, it's a it. massive. In- Think about the massive amount of intelligence gathering on human behavior. They have entire markets and economies on. World- One of my friends said the reason why he was so into it is because their market economy is so advanced in there. There's thousands of people auctioning things off at all times. Yeah. And there's ways to find where secret things are and come out there. 
and people behave. And real stuff gets transferred, right? Like, to real things, uh, they eventually come up with... it all virtual? No, I think there's actually, it becomes real at some point, and you can you get... Know this at least in some of the games. Gaming? <laughs> <laughs> I just we, oh, no, I'm <laughs> We've done it again! <laughs> what is it called? Don't even um, try! Uh, but it's so well, no, because it, it is! Is, we're, we're talking about human behavior, yeah. Yeah. And, it's and, on point. and this is also on point in that human behavior can be engineered very easily. Marketing is a perfect example of how we have engineered. And if you watch, uh, in the, the women's group at one point in time did uh, Killing Us Softly the, about, about how advertising and, and its negative effects on women. And it gets downright creepy to where you'll get sick to your stomach at some points because they talk about how they combine women with objects and how that is the kind of messaging that leads to the people cutting women up. Because a certain type of disturbance plus that imagery wow. equals outcome. doing that. Yeah, and it's outcome. really, it, it's, and, and that's where we get See, into this again. This when stuff. you have enough people, if certain things happen, you will get a measurable amount of a certain other thing. And it, it's creepy how that works, but like a certain percentage, when you expose people to this, a certain percentage of them will, will do, do something really do. bad. Right. When you so put, this is like psychology. It's a social science. It's, well, it's social really, science. really, the social sciences are one science. It's not really a bunch of sciences. They're all sub, I consider them all to be sub-sciences of, it's the science of people. people. What, do, what do people huh. do and, and why? What do people do and why is essentially all of social science. Not, not necessarily, I mean, it goes down to what does a person do all the way to what does the whole world full of people do? I mean, those are all different levels of studying human behavior, essentially. Um, now, microeconomics, which I'm going to be doing an intense study of starting uh, Wednesday, I think, um, is economic analysis that studies decision making, making uh, undertaken by individuals or households and by firms. Now, a firm is like an it's somebody who makes stuff to sell or, or produces services to sell and who provides employment and who and kicks out money to households in the form of wages or dividends or whatever. So that's what a firm is. So that's when you start getting into this relationship between people and firms. It's like, okay, there's a, there's a reciprocal relationship. You provide labor, they provide money, you buy stuff, they sell you stuff. So it's this nice, harmonious relationship. Um, now, aggregate is another important word. Aggregate is like all of it, like the entire enchilada. When we talk about aggregate demand in the United States, that is all demand for goods and services in the United States. Or if we talk about aggregate demand for potatoes, that's all the potatoes that people want. On the planet. Well, if we say, it yeah. depends. It we depends. can say okay. we can say okay. aggregate demand for potatoes in the city of Sacramento and, okay. and, and make a decision about that, or aggregate demand on your block for potatoes. Okay. Maybe yeah. certain blocks, and that's where you find all the yeah. Irish people. We like potatoes, right? So, you know, or yeah. Mark Germans too. They like potatoes, but maybe, you know, maybe a supermarket would be interested in that information of who likes what, so that they can like get the kind of sure. food people prefer to the right kind of people. That's why, it's, that's why it's important to increase demand on more farmers markets and organics. Personally, even if it sometimes hurts a little bit, is that, you know, by creating that demand, um, an example of a company that I don't consider to be a very good company, but they're a pretty efficient beast, which is Walmart, that they're starting to embrace more and more organics, and it's because people are demanding organics. Yeah. I don't want this crazy chemical crap in my stuff. We want organics. And so the more people ask for that, they're the biggest grocery grocer in the United States. That could actually yeah, affect. They didn't do groceries like. Well, how? When, when did they even start doing groceries? It was only. Like I don't know, but it was like a submarine. It was like a submarine ago. attack <laughs> on like. It was. On like on a big percentage of places that That's they went to. Really I mean, like hardcore. in Rancho Cordova, it's in the same parking lot as Safeway, and Safeways Dead. hurt. Oh. Well, no, they wouldn't give. Rancho Cordova wouldn't give them a liquor permit, so you can still get liquor at Safeway, so they still get customers. Wow. wow. But, and they still get some customers, but the thing is, Walmart's got them beat on prices on almost everything. I mean, like, just, and so they're going to get blood dry eventually. I mean, but that's Walmart's pattern. Walmart's a very efficient animal. It, it goes in and just 
macro crushes all the small businesses. Um, so what do you think we should do? Oh, that's getting off time. Do about Never that mind. sort of thing? Uh, see, it's hard. I know. I'm well, not, um, we all have, an, an example. Well, it, it, it's what in we'll a mix, get into. You know? One of the things we're going to get into in the very in the very early parts of this is there's two failures of markets that have to be addressed. And these are things that are not addressed, and it's not okay that they're not addressed. One is market power. And this is this is a little further into our... It, like, it, this might even be a chapter or two further, but this is a good thing to know. Market power, what I mean is excessive market power, where the, the inherent competitiveness of a capitalist economy tends to lower prices because if you have a hundred people making this thing well they're going to end up you're going to end up splitting the difference between the price that you as a customer wants and the price that guy really wants to get for it you guys are going to end up splitting the difference because if you don't someone else will and if you don't match that price then this other guy might drop his price and you're going to get to a point where it's like well i gotta eat too i'm not going any lower than this now here's what walmart does walmart has such a huge they're called a monopsony. This is an interesting, weird word. It's the it's not a monopoly. It's a monopsony. A monopsony is when you have monopoly power over your suppliers. Like literally, you're the person buying stuff, but you buy so much stuff that you can make or break their business. And so you tell them, guess what? I'm gonna order some hangers. We don't agree upon a price. I give you a price, and you give them to me for this price. And if you don't, I'll go find somebody who will. Because I can I can create an entire business just with my demand. I can tell this guy, hey, I'll give you three cents a unit for that. Build a factory. And you know what they do? China builds a factory because their government's willing to fund something like that and go, okay, if we get a long-term contract for this price and blah, blah. But, you know, Walmart also regularly gives these firms the finger. I've, I've talked to people who've had their businesses gutted by Costco or Walmart where they, they started off and they were getting a lot of stuff and so they're like, oh my god, i got to hire like 10 more people and like they're scrambling because the demand starts increasing rapidly and then Walmart's like, eh. and and by then they've taken out a ton of loans and then all of a sudden their demand drops by like 9 tenths god. because they're so busy they can't even meet Walmart's demand so they're increasing so they're not trying to get any other business that's all they got right, that's all they need they're it's the same thing with truckers enough. a lot of these companies all the truckers are now independent contractors they'll make you wait you're, you get paid by the load. They don't got it. And if you don't show up early, you got to get kicked to the back of the line. That means you're coming in tomorrow and not getting unloaded until seven o'clock at night. But you better be here at six in the morning because that's your time, your call time. I mean, that's I've I've heard a lot of complaints from long haul truckers that that's what they're trying to. They're basically making them um, poverty stricken wage slave citizens, just like they're trying to make Everybody virtually else. everyone else. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now. Market power, uh, that there are, that's an example of excessive market power. When you have excessive market power, the free market, as they say, it does not work. And it's and it's shown, it can be shown it does not work. When you have six companies that own, say, 80% or more of the business of an industry, like, when, like our telecommunications is a good example. We have no competition in telecommunications. Those guys are a cartel. Now, they don't directly say they're a cartel but you can't fool me into thinking that I should be paying 50 bucks let alone 120 for phone service and internet given the amount of countries that do it for like less than a quarter of that and they do it way better and and a fatter broadband and they're not as technologically advanced as us so to me that that's profiteering which couldn't happen if we had 150 different phone company, like wireless companies, that each had equal access, mm-hmm. and we just made the public transmission lines a public utility, and they all bought access, and it was based on their service. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't have this problem. Keep the, the price to be very low. That's how when you have the fewer, basically the fewer companies you have in an industry. The more screwed the customers get because, well, I don't know about you, but I need gasoline. It's not an option for me to have gasoline with the with the lifestyle that I am currently leading where I have to manage my kids. I have to make money. I have to go to school full time. I'm doing a lot of light railing, but I have to have a car. Otherwise, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do this teaching if I didn't have a car, really, because um, I had things to do up until the last moment before this teaching. So, um, 
and that's another thing. That's another example of excessive market power. It's not a matter of us having the ability to demand less. Most people are pretty locked into the amount of gas that they consume. They don't have a whole lot of ability to reduce their demand as prices and go survive. up. <laughs> and still exactly. survive in exactly. the economy, right? So it's important to understand the uh, those mechanisms and how they have been used against us um, in a lot of ways, which um, our discussion earlier was that um, we need to get outside the box. Ten minutes to GA, just okay, a little, good. Little so it's important to know the levers that have been used against the against us, because in some in some instances there are fairly obvious ways we can write that um, yes. economics. Uh, seeks efficiency like you know if you have if you have an optimal number of consumers an optimal number of producers which is different for any given industry but essentially you want as many as possible because the more people you have in the pool on either side the more individual entities you have on either side of that equation the qui- the more quickly and the more efficiently it will get to a point of equilibrium where okay well I'm only going to pay so much for an apple we've reached this point so, or I'm only going to pay so much for a car we've reached this point. And uh, here's the part that gets weird. Ec- economists assume that individuals act as if motivated by self-interest and respond predictably to o- opportunities for gain. It's basically rational self-interest. Now, each individual does not behave that way, but in the aggregate, people do behave that way. And we can actually look when you deal with things like marketing, this is an important part of the levers that we can start getting in our favor. Because I think a lot of marketing should start to be essentially outlawed um, in some ways. I mean, just the way that it's done, I, I don't agree with, I mean, when you're when you're basically studying neuroscientific principles in order to induce compulsive behavior in children and, you, and you're and you're pumping that into their heads in a, in a very organized, I mean, in a very provably organized fashion, you are attempting to manipulate behavior. I think yeah. we need to look at that as a thing and discuss that as a thing. Say, okay, this marketing is designed this way to do this. And yes, we have free will, but it get back, gets back down to the monkey thing. We're still, we're not in complete control of ourselves certain stimuli can change you into a different type of person and that's very provable. Mm-hmm. Solitary confinement will turn your brain into mush. That's provable. Uh, a child growing up in Africa who's snatched up and put into one of these child armies will be the most vicious sociopathic killer that you can possibly imagine. Because if you teach a child from the time they have memory that you're loyal to this tribe and you kill, they will be efficient completely remorseless killers because they don't see the people they're killing as it being a problem. This is, this is life. This is normal. This is normal life. And, uh, you know, there were times in, in Homo sapiens history that that was very much true. That if, if you weren't really good at fighting, chances are you were not going to live to have a baby. You would, Like, you had to be able to be tough enough to defend against threats that were pretty crazy. You had to be clever enough to avoid threats that would just eat everybody or uh, and or other tribes that sort of thing so all this science kind of it comes from a long term I mean Adam Smith in 1776 came up with this rational this rational person um, to describe aggregate humanity and he's really the founder of modern economic theory which has been modified a, a big old ton of times now The rationality assumption of economics is stated as this. We assume that individuals do not intentionally make decisions that would have them worse off. That's essentially the rationality decision. We assume that you will not intentionally make yourself worse off. Now, we know that occasionally people do do that, but that gets into abnormal... It's not normal for you to do to intentionally do things that make you worse off. It's not healthy for you to do those things. I'm wondering if, if, like, maybe within like a minute, because we all have five minutes to get over there. Okay. Some of us have to, like, sure, you know, be involved um, or or choose it. So if you accept that, if you accept that, and I, it, it's extremely defensible. Um, 
And how do you explain the Republic? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. All right. All right. Now let's move on. If I can convince you, goes back to marketing, in my opinion. How about this? If I can convince you that it's in your best interest to do a certain thing, you're not being irrational. Right. You've just been given information that information led you to a rational, yeah. Yeah. that led you to what your own you rational decision that that will make you better. Yeah. Right. You're being bamboozled, is what it is. Is it, what it, some would say, but yeah. others would say, no, I have the accurate information. You. Yes. Well, no, no, I'm saying if, right. if you were to make a decision that makes you worse off, I'm saying. Right, in fact. And you, and, and, and in you fact. thought in it made fact. you. Right. In, in fact. In fact, then you were told incorrect yeah. information, yeah. and whether that's intentional or not is a subject for, yeah. for judgment. I have fought us yeah. one and all. Thank you.